Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you today, Eva Bori, who's the Assistant Director of Admissions at Syracuse University. Eva, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm doing well, John. Thank you so much for having me today. I know that we've discussed this in the past, but I truly do think that this platform is indispensable for students and prospective families and applicants as they go through the college application process. So thank you for creating something like this. And I'm hoping that students and families are tuning in throughout the year and and really learning as much as they can about this process. Our job as admission counselors and advisors is to really take every opportunity that we can to demystify this process uh, wherever and however we can. So thank you for this platform, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Well, it's been an honor and a pleasure as I get to meet amazing people like yourself while helping so many students and their parents. So thank you again for being here. And Eva, let me start by asking you to give us a brief introduction about yourself. How long have you been in admissions, and how did you end up in such a position? Absolutely, John. Thank you. So I think for me, my intention throughout elementary school, junior high, high school, and then going through college, of course, was always to be in education. At one point, it was to be a teacher. And then as I transitioned into Syracuse University, which I actually graduated from back with the class of 2011, I learned that higher education could be a career. And so on campus, I was involved in everything higher ed related from working as an orientation leader to being a student tour guide and ambassador, uh, holding three work study jobs on campus. Campus, uh, working within the residence halls, psychology club, and a few other clubs and organizations, uh, residing in one of our living learning communities on campus as well, studying abroad. And so I think all of these elements uh, throughout my undergraduate years led me to pursue higher education as a career. And so I, as I communicated and interacted with my academic advisors and um, resident hall assistants, I was really starting to realize that these individuals do this for a living. And so the only options for education weren't just being a teacher, for instance, but really there were so many other options within higher ed. And so I just loved being on a college campus and decided to make higher education a career. I transitioned to Stony Brook after graduating from Syracuse with degrees in psychology and communications to study higher education for my master's degree. And so that was home for another year and a half for my master's. And then I actually started out my career at Adelphi on Long Island and worked with a brilliant team there for about seven and a half years transitioned back to Stony Brook, my graduate alma mater, for about two years. And then I think things have sort of come full circle now being back at Syracuse working with the admissions team. I really do feel that I found my permanent home. Um, And so I do look forward to many more decades advocating on behalf of Syracuse. And being an alum, I think it really does give me a different sense of credibility to advocate for the school and incorporate my own personal experiences there as a student when I'm talking to prospective students and families. Well, that's a terrific introduction. And I didn't realize, Eva, that we have so much in common. I actually went to Stony Brook University as an undergrad. 
I live on Long Island, and here we are talking about the awesome Syracuse University. Yeah. So as a graduate, like you said, from 2011 of Syracuse University, Eva, what are some of the things that you personally love about Syracuse that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? Yes, and thank you for asking, John. I, I don't always get to talk about my personal experience at Syracuse. I'm always sort of advocating on behalf of the schools and the different um, teams within the university and the different majors and minors. So it's always great to share my own personal experience and why I loved it so much for the four years that I was there. So I think first and foremost, academically, being that we aren't a specialized school. So we do have nine schools within the university. If a student comes in as an engineering major or as a music major, architecture, journalism, whatever that interest may be, and they change their mind in the first or second year, they have the option to transition into eight other different schools within the university, nine total, uh, 200 majors, 100 minors, full plans of studies on our website for all of these programs. So students can use that as sort of a comparison tool as they're comparing our curriculum for different programs to other schools and colleges as well throughout the U.S. or even abroad. Um, so I do think academically we are a very holistic environment and really have something for everyone, I think. Um, and then sort of on that same track with academics, we are a large research one university. Our faculty and schools are really going to emphasize research. But even though we are a large university, average class size is about 26 students. And so when you're in the classroom, I always tell students and families that I, for my own experience, never felt like a number at Syracuse. Faculty and advisors always knew me by name. And so students at Syracuse will never sit in a lecture hall of 300 to 400 students. It'll always be a personalized learning environment. And the faculty are very much invested in seeing these students succeed during their four years at Syracuse, but also beyond that as they go and seek out employment opportunities and career outcomes as well. Um, another thing that was important to me that I think our students value is study abroad partnerships and really sort of globally um, engaging your resume and your experience throughout your four years as an undergraduate student. So our abroad programs are consistently ranked top 10 in the nation. They're some of the oldest and most seasoned programs. We have five partner centers around the world. Um, and in addition to that, over 100 other different countries that we work with, as well as domestic centers in the US. So our faculty are going to encourage students to branch out and step away from Syracuse at one point or, or multiple semesters throughout their time on campus. And so that can include studying in our Washington DC center, Los Angeles center, Upper East Side in New York City, or of course, a broad across the world as well. Uh, campus spirit is always something that I love to mention from our division one athletics to intramurals, club sports, over 300 clubs and organizations on campus. There is something for everyone at Syracuse. And if there is a club or organization that we don't have, we always encourage students to take the initiative with a faculty team member to start their own club and really start crafting their resume early on with leadership opportunities and engaging themselves as much as they can on campus. Um, location wise, we are in the heart of central New York. And so great location for students that may not want to be right in the center of a big city, but still have these big cities, Boston, DC, New York City, within five to six hours of driving distance for internships and co-ops and semesters away. And then lastly, I think I'd have to mention our notable alum, which are very willing to help our current students and build their networks throughout their time at Syracuse, always coming back onto campus to step foot inside our classroom so that students can meet them, um, take part in other programming that we offer for students, just again, for them to build their network. So our alumni are everywhere from our current president, which was a law school alum from Syracuse, to the current New York State governor, um, Hollywood actor. Olympic gold medalists, Pulitzer Prize winners. I mean, really any category that you can think of, there is a Syracuse alum that is represented within that category. And I think the neat part is that all have come back onto campus and do personally engage with our students to, again, just open up their connection and networks as they uh, are looking to pursue employment opportunities and graduate opportunities post-graduation. Well, we really appreciate that introduction, and I love how you yeah. talked about you, the fact that you have nine different schools, 
over 200 majors, over 100 minors, which is great because if a student comes to Syracuse University and they decide to change their major, as many students do, at a school like Syracuse, there are so many choices for everyone. So again, we really appreciate that. I also love how you talked about the fact that the average class size is 26 students, which is basically an extension of what most high schools are throughout the country. And of course, the Syracuse school spirit. And I'm glad you mentioned that as well, because I just recently read a statistic that in terms of your retention rate, it's well over 90%. So that's a testament of the great work you do in admissions to make sure that the right students are accepted, but also the great work that Syracuse does as a family to make sure that the students are happy once they're on campus. So we appreciate that. So Eva, visiting campus, if at all possible, is obviously a very important part of determining whether or not a school is the right fit for you. So if a student and their parents are able to visit campus, what are some of the sites that they should visit? But also, what are some of the questions they should be asking to help determine whether or not Syracuse University is in fact the right fit for them? Absolutely, John, and thank you for asking again. So I always uh, encourage students, even when I'm working with Syracuse-specific students that know Syracuse is their top choice school, to really explore through this process. And so even though I'm advocating on behalf of Syracuse, I want them to visit multiple campuses. I want students to visit small campuses versus larger campuses in different states, different regions, private schools, public schools, colleges versus universities, and really really to start envisioning themselves or not on some of these campuses. So once they are at Syracuse, there are so many ways for them to engage with our teams, engage with our admissions office, um, and, and demonstrate interest. So, so really, I think that visiting in itself demonstrates interest. And so <laughs> registering for some available open houses, daily visits, virtual events that now I think most schools offer. Uh, once they're on campus, taking the opportunity to, to, to connect with teams from the nine different schools within Syracuse that all have their own recruiting offices and making sure that students are putting putting their names on these schools' radars because we do receive over 45 to 45,000 applications a year. So I think wow. any ways that students and families can put their names on our radar, um, I think will add a lot of value to their application. And then in terms of questions to ask, I always encourage students to begin with the tour guides because they are current students. So maybe if the family or students are a bit nervous to talk to faculty or to talk to you know admission professionals, starting with those tour guides. Uh, the tour guides are gonna be able to share so much personal experience from their own majors, their own research opportunities, internships, their residential experience, study abroad experiences. And then I think from there, as they become more comfortable having these conversations, calling our admission offices, calling our different schools and continuing these conversations and dialogues uh, with different teams on campus, asking about career and outcome related statistics. We do a great job of this on our website through an entire career pathways and outcomes uh, web link, but really making sure they're asking what percentage of students are graduating and successfully employed post-graduation or in graduate programs, asking what the completion rate for these surveys is, how many seniors are responding back to the school. And I know for Syracuse, it's over 95% of seniors are uh, responding back to these surveys post-graduation and we have a 94 percent um, employment rate post-graduation or students that are either joining the military or graduate programs so it's a great testament to our career teams and that the work that they do within each of the different schools to make sure students are, are set up for success through the different industries that they're looking to go into asking about admission requirements and deadlines, of course, through the campus visit process. Uh, four plus one programs. So uh, talking to the teams on campus to get a sense of how much money and time can you save on the graduate level? Does a school offer programs to earn your bachelor's and your master's within five or six years? Do they offer accelerated law or medical programs, which Syracuse does, of course. Uh, but these questions, I think, all sort of will add value to that campus as visit experience and hopefully students are able to leave with a lot more knowledge than maybe what they're just seeing on the website. Um, and then lastly, I would recommend all students to ask about who their specific admission counselors are. So 
Myself, for instance, I manage all of Long Island and I'm the territory manager for that region and work with the applicants specifically from their early decision and regular decision applicants and a little bit out of state in Texas as well. But we do have a full extensive team that works with all of the states within the U.S. and hundreds of different countries around the world as well. And so making sure that you're connecting with your specific admission counselor from different schools and colleges, I think is really important. So that way you have one person to go to throughout this process, because it can be a very overwhelming process, but hopefully in the end, a very rewarding one as well. Hey, podcast friends, are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear? Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. As an affiliate partner with Prep Sportswear, the podcast does receive a small commission if you make a purchase. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel that would benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. Well, we really appreciate that information and the data points that you shared. Eva, I always put the Office of Undergraduate Admissions in the show notes. If there's anything else that you want me to include, just provide it to me, and obviously we'll make it available to the students and parents again in the show notes. Now, you touched upon demonstrated interest, but Eva, I was curious, what are some of the other things that students do to demonstrate their interest in attending Syracuse University? And is this something that you track as part of your overall admissions process? Absolutely, John. So thank you for asking again. I think demonstrated interest is one of those mysterious elements of the college admission process. And so uh, schools may or may not be disclosing if they're using demonstrated interest or how they're using it. But I can certainly say uh, for certain that most, if not all schools are definitely tracking interest, even if they're not necessarily using it in the admission process, depending on their applicant pools, depending on selectivity and the competition throughout the admission process process. Uh, so I think from the simple surface level things to emails, right? I always let students know <laughs> that if you're receiving emails from your top choice schools, make sure you're opening them. Schools and colleges can see if you're even opening these emails. Now we can't tell if you're reading them, but we can see those open rates. So especially for your top choice schools, make sure at the very sort of surface level, uh, baseline level, you're opening your emails because schools can see that. Uh, there are so many other ways to demonstrate interest from college fairs to visiting uh, with the admission counselors at the high school if they're going to be making trips to your high school. Uh, schools will sort of take attendance for these events, college fairs and high school visits. And not only is it great for the students to put their names on our radar, uh, but really will show us that they have stopped by to see us, that we've engaged in some form of conversation with the students. And sometimes we even see uh, parents and families at college visits at the high school or especially college fairs. So making sure that uh, you are doing what you can to be present in this process, I think will add a lot of value to your application calling or emailing the admission office, another great way to engage and interact. And we do track the amount of communication um, that, that is going on through this process. And I always like to tell students that this is very much a partnership. Uh, we are working with you and with your families to advocate on your behalf when we're sitting in admission committees and we're we're sitting with the different schools within the university. We want to advocate on your behalf. We want to advocate on having met you, having conversed with you, and why we think you'd be a great fit. And of course, we love our territory. So I would love to admit all of my <laughs> applicants from Long Island, but it makes it a little bit easier when you are demonstrating interest and when you're doing your part as a part of this uh, partnership, I think. Interviews, another great way to demonstrate interest for Syracuse. They're not required, they're optional, but very informal, non-intimidating opportunities for you to connect with us for about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe half an hour of conversation. I really don't even call them interviews, I call them conversations, where I sit with students all throughout the fall and spring. Now we're doing all of them virtually, and that's our best practice that will be sort of um, established permanently. We've been able to reach thousands of more 
more students virtually than we have in person. So I think it really has become a best practice for us. And so um, making sure that you're scheduling some of these interviews in the fall of your senior year, especially with your top choice schools, even if they're not required, I think shows colleges that you're taking the initiative to go beyond just the simplest, you know, surface level steps of submitting a common app and your supporting documents. Um, and then, of course, I think connecting. I mentioned with each school or college within the universities that you're considering. Uh, admission offices are sort of one element to campus, but call, you know, at Syracuse, for instance, our Newhouse School or our School of Architecture or our College of Engineering, Visual and Performing Arts. Give them a call and introduce yourselves. Uh, like I said, they each all have their own recruiting offices. And so the many, the, the more people that you can connect with throughout this process is going to add value when we're reviewing your application. And then of course, visitation opportunities on campus. We offer so many open houses, which we call orange previews, daily visits, campus tours. All of these opportunities I think are not just there for you to demonstrate interest, but for you to continue learning and educating yourself on this process. And I think for myself personally, whenever I'm meeting with students or families. I, of course, am advocating on behalf of Syracuse, but I really want that visit process to be holistic for them. I want to give them holistic advice that can sort of apply and be transferable to this process in general, not just the Syracuse process. And so I think visiting is really going to equip students with a lot more knowledge and insight than maybe what they might be getting through a guidance office, you know, guidance counselors that have huge caseloads and are working working with hundreds of students uh, through this process. Uh, through campus visits, you're able to get a little bit more specific information but also envision yourself physically on that campus. Do I see myself at Syracuse living in this residence hall to the left or right, or do I not? And so I think the campus visits are really invaluable. And if students are not able to do them in the fall, some students will wait until they receive an admission decision, which in my opinion might be a little too late, but better late than never to get onto campus, especially before May 1 as a senior, which is that universal deadline to let colleges know whether you'll be enrolling or withdrawing at that point. Well, Eva, that's a lot of great information, and it's part of the reason why we have these conversations, so that yes. students interested in Syracuse University, I hope that you're listening, that you certainly do track demonstrated interests, and I think you gave great advice. First of all, open the emails. If there are links, engage with them. Yes. Colleges have the ability to track that, but also stay connected. If you're on campus and do visit, if at all possible, go to the admissions office, try to find out who your admissions counselor is. Or if you see you're an admissions counselor at a college fair, introduce yourselves. If there's a card, a QR code, so that you could leave your information, do not forget to do that. These are things that are very important. And in the case of Syracuse University, it's something that they do track. So Eva, thank you again. That was tremendous information. What about an honors program at Syracuse, Eva? Do you have an honors program and how are students considered? In other words, is it something that they have to apply to separately? Absolutely, John. So we do have our renowned Renee Crown University Honors Program that I think is just a great opportunity for students that have been very successful academically throughout high school to transition into the collegiate level in a rigorous and much more challenging environment. So students will have to apply separately to the Honors Program. And so uh, typically the team that reviews Honors College is looking for, again, academically successful, accomplished students that are prepared for the rigor of an honors uh, program on the college level. And so there are many things that they're looking for to sort of establish that eligibility from your trend in grades on the transcript to the rigor of your curriculum, test scores if students choose to submit them, uh, the advocacy and the recommendation letters, how well well-written the personal statement is. So all of these elements are going to be evaluated through that honors selection process and the selection process to admission to the university in whole as well. Um, but honors really reserved for students that are looking for much more smaller class sizes on the college level. Uh, advantages are going to include living in a specific honors living learning community on campus. So you'll likely all have the same exam schedules through different classes if you're um, within the same majors as each other. You're going to have a little bit more of a more challenging curriculum. Um, and so 
If a student is not admitted in their first year through high school credentials, there's also the opportunity then to apply into honors after the first year at Syracuse. So the team is going to review performance in that first year to make sure that students are prepared to transition into honors, hopefully in their second year. So there is sort of another pathway in addition to applying as a first year student. And of course, we would connect any prospective honors uh, inquiries or applicants to teams on campus that are going to help them uh, through and facilitate this process for them. But it is a selective, it is a competitive process. I always encourage students to sort of check off, disclose interest on the application, and we will take the lead on the review process for honors. Well, we appreciate that. Again, great information for students and parents. And yeah. for our next question, yes. I'm actually going to ask Gina from New Jersey, who's on the email opt-in list, to ask the following question. Gina? Thanks, John. My question is, does legacy play a role in the overall admissions process? In other words, if a student's parent attended the school, do you take that into consideration in making your decision? Thank you so much, Gina. So I will say that Syracuse has an alumni base of over 260,000 around the U.S. and the world. And so it's not surprising for us at all to see legacy and alumni disclosed on the application. And students will disclose parents that are alum through their personal statements or even additional comments section on the Common App. They might even tell us that they have a number of family members, uncles, aunts, et cetera, that have graduated from Syracuse uh, throughout the past decades as well. So we do love to hear that and we do love to see it. On the Common Application, there is space to disclose this information and we certainly encourage you to disclose, especially if mother or father uh, or guardian has attended Syracuse. But of course, I think the important thing to remember is that admissions and admissions into one of the nine, or if you're applying for a dual program, two of the nine different schools within the university is going to be contingent on meeting the academic requirements and eligibility for the specific programs. And so I think legacy is something that all students should disclose because we want to know sort of where that Syracuse connection is. Um, very similarly, we want to know on the application are you a first generation student? Are you applying to college for the first time? And, and the hardships and challenges that may come along with that. So I think there are very specific special populations um, that we go ahead and evaluate and, and we sort of uh, take pride in knowing that they're applying to Syracuse, whether they've had parents come to Syracuse or whether they're the first in their family that are applying to college. We want to know all of this. But again, important to note that admission requirements are sort of uh, going to be based on your academic credentials and eligibility is going to be based on how academically prepared are you to join our programs. Some programs are more selective than others. And so the goal is to really set students up for success. And so if there is a program that you're applying to and we're seeing through your credentials, that you're not necessarily academically eligible, we will, of course, review you for your second choice. And if you've disclosed on the application that you'd like Syracuse to consider you for an alternate program that we think you might be a good fit for, we would do that as well. That's a SU pick option on the Common App. And so there are different pathways to admission. We always want to know uh, if you have family members that have attended Syracuse, but ultimately that decision process is going to be based on academic eligibility and us setting you up for success in these programs. I think um, the worst thing we can do as admission counselors is admit students into programs that we don't think they're going to thrive in. And so we want to set you up for success that first year um, and make sure that we're retaining you in these programs and on campus and really selecting the best fits, not just academically for the school, but also for our campus community what you can contribute on campus and leadership opportunities that you might hold on campus as well. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who is the founder and CEO of Prep Expert. He's a Shark Tank entrepreneur making a deal with Mark Cuban back in 2016. And he's also a board certified dermatologist who received a perfect score on his SAT. Sean, welcome back. How are you doing today? 
I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, John. So I just wanted to share with all your listeners real quick that we have an amazing partnership with the College Admissions Process Podcast, and we have a really special offer for all of your listeners. So for any listener who wants to enroll their student into one of our prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one-on-one tutoring programs, you can get 30% off just for being a listener of the College Admissions Process Podcast. All you need to do is put in the promo code College Talk, one word, just College Talk, and that'll give you 30% off all prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one-on-one tutoring packages. Make sure you use the link in the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. To our listeners, as an affiliate partner with Prep Expert, I want to be transparent with you that for every purchase made using our coupon code, which is College Talk, the College Admissions Process Podcast will receive a small commission from Prep Expert. But rest assured that we only promote programs that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. So whether you're preparing for the SAT, ACT, or need a one-on-one tutor, Prep Expert has the tools and expertise to help you. For more information, please see the Prep Expert affiliate partnership link in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. Well, thank you so much, Eva, for that very thorough and detailed explanation. We appreciate it. And I also want to thank Gina from New Jersey for posing your question. For the listeners, if anyone is interested in being on the email opt-in list, please check out the link in the show notes, or you could always visit the website for more information at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. Thank you so much again, Eva. And I know Syracuse University, like many other schools, is in fact test optional. But Eva, can you share the percentage of students that apply and are ultimately admitted that did not submit their test scores? Sure, John. So thank you for asking. So test optional for Syracuse, I think, is um, it is a newer landscape. And so we have been test optional for the past few years, although traditionally we have required testing. So I think as students are getting used to this new landscape of test optional, so are many different institutions and we're all learning from this process together. And so being test optional means that we will not um, review your testing, even if you've submitted but have checked off on the application that you would not like your scores to be reviewed or evaluated in the admissions and review process. And so um, sometimes students will disclose test scores on the common application, um, but but not want them to be taken into account. And so in that case, we will not be using them in the review process. I would say in terms of statistics from these last few years, about half of our applicants are choosing to submit testing and the other half are are not, the half that are not, it's not being held against them that they're not submitting testing. And so what we're doing is reviewing all other academic credentials very closely. That includes your transcripts, cumulative GPA as one element of the transcript, but also trend in grades, Has there been an upward trend or a downward trend throughout the past three years uh, in high school? The rigor of your curriculum. Have you challenged yourselves with within the context of what your high school is offering? Have you taken AP classes, IB classes, college credits throughout high school, accelerated honors? And so important to note with that as well as we always lean on the school profile uh, to make sure that we are aware of what the high school is offering an applicant that's coming from a high school that offers three APs versus an applicant that's coming from a high school that offers 20, these two applicants are not going to be compared to each other. So the rigor of your curriculum and your transcript is really only being reviewed within the context of your high school and your high school profile. And if that's not submitted through your counselors, we will find it on the website or we will reach out. Um, And of course, if you're not submitting testing, there are many other elements that we're looking at. Have you scheduled an interview? What can we use from the interview, uh, from notes that we've made about what you may want to pursue on campus, things that you've done outside of the high, uh, outside of the classroom throughout high school? 
We're looking at the advocacy in your recommendation letters, how well written your personal statement is. All of these elements are uh, really plenty for us to, to determine whether you're academically prepared or not for the rigor of some of our curriculums and programs. Um, in terms of guidance, I always encourage students for Syracuse to call one or multiple of our nine different schools and colleges and ask what the average test scores were from the last incoming admitted applicant pool. Um, so what that means is every school is going to look a little bit different. Some schools are smaller with less spots to fill, and so they are going to be a little bit more selective in the numbers um, and credentials that they're looking for. Other schools are much bigger schools on campus, um, so they have many more spots to fill. So it might make that selectivity a little less than a school that has less spots to fill. So I always encourage calling, asking what that average test score was before you make the decision on if you're going to submit test scores to Syracuse or not. If you're on the phone with these schools and you're listening to the averages, you're above them or within them, it's a great sign that you should submit. It'll add value to your application. If you're listening to these averages and you're below them and maybe you're not taking the testing again, it's not a great representation of you academically, but you have much stronger credentials through your transcript, rec letters, essay, great interview, et cetera. I would say hold off on submitting. Again, it will not be held against you because we are in a test optional landscape and we will be uh, for juniors applying or, or seniors, I should say, applying for the class of 2024. Uh, that has been announced that we will remain test optional. So students can continue uh, making the decision on whether they want these scores submitted or not. Having said all of this, I always, always encourage students to take the testing, take the SAT, take the ACT, even if you know that you'll only be applying to test optional schools. It gives you a choice as an applicant to make the right choice for you. And maybe you'll take the testing and surprise yourself and do exceedingly well, and you'll rise above the averages for some of these programs. And maybe you've had a weaker semester or two in high school. So the testing can balance things out a little bit. But always, I would say, make sure that you are preparing to take these standardized tests throughout high school. It's a great opportunity to challenge yourself as well. And again, with test optional schools, you'll then be prepared to make the choice depending on on what you see with your performance, on whether it's going to help you or hurt you, in which case you want to um, hold off on submitting. Well, thank you so much for the detailed explanation again. And I also appreciate how you encourage students and their parents to call. You have nine different schools at Syracuse University. So definitely reach out if you have specific questions. Absolutely. I was also curious, Eva, where do you think the test optional landscape is going in the next couple of years and beyond? Absolutely. So I think, John, similar to you know what we've experienced with COVID these past few years and the transition to virtual, um, so we have some best practices at Syracuse that are going to stick because they've been very successful for us, including, for instance, virtual interviews. And so we've been able to reach thousands more students in the U.S. and abroad through our virtual interview process. And I use that sort of in comparison to the testing process, having gone test optional, we We've been able to focus and prioritize student character and different credentials aside from just numbers throughout this process the past few years. And I think it's led us to admit a much more holistic class um, in terms of first year students uh, that are really on campus for the right reasons and that are making an impact on campus, getting involved through clubs and organizations. It's given us a chance to prioritize student activity lists and resumes. And again, look beyond just academic um, eligibility, but also holistically what these students are going to uh, translate in terms of their leadership opportunities in high school, how that's going to translate on the college level. And so again, not only do we want to make the best choice on academic fits, but also on the extracurricular end, on the athletic end, intramural, club sports, clubs, organizations, what are you as an applicant going to contribute to our community? And so I think 
Research has definitely shown that test scores are not necessarily um, a competing priority in this process and that there are so many more credentials that we can focus on to help us determine how successful are you going to be within your majors, within the different schools, research opportunities, um, how successful are you going to be in helping faculty start research and complete research, how successful are you going to be abroad if you study abroad and do internships abroad. And so I think looking beyond the numbers uh, is very valuable. And so I know that not all institutions are there yet. And some institutions have tried test optional and have gone back to uh, requiring testing, which I, I think is all sort of appropriate. Um, within the context of what the institutional priorities are and so what the enrollment priorities are. I think at Syracuse, we sort of have that privilege of looking beyond the numbers and really trying to prioritize finding the best fits for our campus. And that doesn't always mean uh, what test score you have or what cumulative GPA it ha you have as a student, but just going beyond that and making sure that we're connecting with you and that students are connecting with us to really determine how successful you're going to be academically and, and how are we going to support you through the four years into the employment process. And a lot of that, I think, is um, dialogue and conversation. And a lot of it is um, showing what you can do on campus and giving students the opportunity to do that, as opposed to limiting them just through numbers in the admissions process. Well, we really appreciate that insight and your explanation of the holistic approach. So Eva, let's yeah. dig even deeper, if you don't mind, yes. with the increase in schools going test optional and of yeah. course, the ease with which to apply thanks to things like the common application. Yes. Schools are receiving far more applications than ever before. I think you said right. there's over 14,000 undergraduate students and right. you receive well over 40,000 applications a year. Yes. So how do you determine the number of applicants to accept, waitlist, and even deny when you receive far more applications than uh, seats available for deserving students. Absolutely, John. So I think um, with Syracuse, we're very fortunate to have specific recruiting teams within the nine different schools at the university uh, that are experts in those industries. So we have different teams in the business school, in engineering, in architecture, education, College of Arts and Sciences, Newhouse, and we sort of lean on the experts within these teams to give us those baseline credentials for admission. And so that is based on research, um, having seen what past students from other past graduating classes, um, students that have been successful, what they've come in with at Syracuse. And so in central admissions, we sort of receive these guidelines and we receive you know, cumulative GPAs that we should really be looking for, a different rigor on the transcript that we should be looking for, uh, uh, classes on the transcript that we should be looking for, depending on the schools that you may be interested in applying to. So I think having that support and having those guidelines from our different schools, from experts in those schools uh, that have maybe worked in those industries and have worked with students within those schools the past few years, you know, as they go through the four-year process um, and then graduate, those guidelines are really helpful to us. And they sort of facilitate the process of who we're admitting within these programs, who we're denying, unfortunately, and also then who we're waitlisting. Um, so I think that all students should sort of come into this process as positive as possible and as optimistic as possible. Um, I always like to emphasize that this is going to be a very rewarding process. And so at the end of the day, you're going to attend as a student one college for the next four years. And so even if you're not admitted to 10 different colleges, you are going to be admitted where you belong. You're going to be admitted to the school that has looked at your credentials and has determined that this is where you're going to be successful. You are a great fit for their academic program. You can offer so much in their community. And so I think just trusting the process and um, not focusing, especially from the very beginning, on um, wait list or thinking about 
you know, being denied from a school, but really trusting that you've come up with a great list of schools that you've visited and that you've engaged with, and now sort of trusting again that partnership. And so, and also, of course, connecting with us throughout the process. So, you know, if you're a early, an early decision student connecting with us in September, October to ask all of your questions, be prepared as possible to go into the early decision process. If you're a regular decision student, continuing to stay connected with us through our deadline in January and taking the fall of senior year to stay connected with us, ask our, all of your questions, connect with the schools, see which ones you might be a best fit for, so I think a lot of it has to do with preparation as you go into this process and making sure that you have a list that is sort of personal and authentic to you, not applying to schools just because your peers or your friends are applying to them, but applying to schools that you've really connected with and that you know that perhaps to one of their programs or multiple programs you'd be a good fit for, and then trusting that admission process to review all of your credentials and see that for themselves. Well, that's great insight into the Syracuse process, but also great overall advice. Thank you so much, Eva. Let's unpackage the overall application a little further and talk about college essays. So Eva, what are some examples of college essays that left an impression with you, but for the wrong reasons? And what advice would you share with prospective students in terms of what to think about when they sit down to start writing their essays? Absolutely, John. So thank you for asking. And I know that sometimes this is an uncomfortable question, especially if students are sort of in the situation and maybe they realize at a later time. But I think the biggest example I can give of an application that has sort of gone the wrong way is applying to an institution and using another college's name, right? So <laughs> I think all schools are going to, you know, see this differently and um, sort of place their own context in how they want to evaluate this. But my advice is make sure that if you are using names or specific details in these personal statements, that they are specific to the institutions you're applying for. Now, most students will have one uh, essay that they'll submit through the Common App that's going to be applicable to many different institutions, many colleges and universities. And then they'll possibly use the additional comment section of the Common App to give some more specific details on why Syracuse or why another institution, why that's their first choice or one of their top choices. And so um, beyond that, I would always say with the essay, you want it to be all about showcasing yourself. Um, and I think the best way to approach that is to really take some time before you start writing the essay to reflect on who you are. And, and so we're asking a lot of youth, you know, 17, 18 year olds that are going through this process, we're asking them to possibly know what they want to study in college, which most don't. And coming in undecided is perfectly appropriate. Um, we're asking them to, to meet several different deadlines for several different schools, you know, take testing possibly, continue with a strong upward trend on their transcripts. There's a lot that's being asked from youth. Um, but I think the essay is really a great opportunity for students to sort of take a step back and take some time to just reflect on who they are, you know, what they're looking to pursue and what they're looking to get out of college. I always tell the prospective students and families that I'm working with, the best way I can sort of frame this is don't think about what do you want to be after graduation, but think about who you want to be and sort of putting those elements into the personal statement, um, letting us know, you know, who you are, your character traits, your strengths, your weaknesses. I think all of that will make for a really valuable essay. Um, what are you passionate about? What's most important to you? How have you dealt with challenges in your life or within schooling? Uh, so th there's there's just so many years to unpack from when you were very young to now graduating high school. And I think using that personal statement wisely to unpack all of this and then making sure that you're gathering some feedback after you've crafted that essay. So maybe having an English teacher look at the essay um, for you and with you, guidance counselors, peers, family members. Um, but most importantly, I think trying to be as creative and authentic as you can will go a very long way. Well, we really appreciate that. And I love how you talked about 
not expressing what you want to be after graduation, right. but who you want to be. I think that's great right. advice. Thank you so much, Eva. And continuing yes. down with another portion of the application, what can you tell us about the activity sheet in terms of what you're looking for beyond the work they did in the classroom? Absolutely, John. So I think this is great insight too. This is one of our one of my interview questions, I should say. I know all of our admission team members will ask slightly different questions throughout our virtual interviews in the fall, but this is certainly one of mine, uh, asking what students have pursued outside of the classroom, because I think that truly is as important as what you've done in the classroom and your performance trend throughout your transcript. And so looking at that trend on your resume or activity list. For Syracuse, I think the most important thing is if we can see two or three activities that you've invested the majority of your time in versus an activity list with 17 different activities, but you just haven't <laughs> invested as much time um, and effort into those activities. We can sort of see beyond that surface level when we're looking at your activity list and we can sense that level of investment in what you've done outside of the classroom. And that can include anything from clubs and organizations and sports within the high school, but also jobs. Maybe you haven't had much time to be involved in clubs and organizations because you've had to work to support your family or support yourself. And so um, sometimes students will shy away from that. But, you know, I've had plenty of interviews with students that have said they've worked at McDonald's for their entire high school career, and that's where they've gained their leadership uh, skills. And so all of that is so important to be disclosed onto your application because it does give us another layer to work with. It gives us a layer into your personality, into your character, um, and just really important in the sense of how can all of that translate then onto our community? And so we start thinking as admission counselors, what clubs and organizations is this applicant going to be a good fit for? Uh, so again, just as important, I think, as your academic credentials to make sure that you are disclosing all of your outside of the classroom involvement um, and not being modest throughout this process. And so I've worked with so many applicants that are very modest and that is their nature, but really understanding that through this process, you want to disclose as much information as possible. It is all confidential to our admission teams. And so using different sections within the application, whether it's the additional comment section of the Common App or or um, emailing us with another document that you think is important that showcases who you are and making sure that we have all of the pieces to this puzzle, so to speak. Well, we appreciate that. And I was also curious as part of this conversation, yes. Eva, once a student commits to a college, yes. how important is it for them to withdraw from other colleges where they may have been accepted? And can you give us some insight into how difficult the process becomes for you yes. in terms of, again, determining how many students to accept or not from your own, for example, wait list yes. when you don't have a final number on how many accepted students are going to actually attend? Absolutely, John. So I think that this becomes sort of a conversation among admission teams across, you know, across many different institutions, not just Syracuse. And so um, really trying to, to communicate to students that being on a wait list or being denied doesn't necessarily mean that you're not academically eligible, um, but but more so in terms of our institutional um, priorities and, and numbers and what that looks like, we don't necessarily always have space to accommodate all eligible students into these programs. And so that is in alignment, I think, with trying to keep our average class sizes down, you know, making sure that students on campus are really getting the best experience possible an individualized, a personalized process. We don't want to admit all of our applicants and then have students sit in lecture halls of 300 to 500 students. I think that that's, dis, that that's not advantageous um, to our students and what we're promising them from the campus experience. So important to note that this is one of those reasons that you should be applying to multiple institutions and doing your research and, and trying to find multiple good fits for you that you can apply into. Because again, ultimately you will be attending one school. Um, so I think when it comes down to the wait list and, and denying students, 
we do have to sometimes look past eligibility and, and see at that time, where are the numbers? Where are the enrollment figures? Um, and it does become a very difficult decision. And I think with that, we then sort of transition into the transfer process. If we have applicants that we're not necessarily able to admit in that first year, talking to them about what transferring looks like and the advantages of transferring in your second year and, and how you can still be kept on very much a track for a four or five year graduation timeline if you're doing a four plus one program. And so having that conversation and giving students options, I think is really important. And most schools, um, I think, uh, will be very open to having those conversations. I know at Syracuse, we have a specific transfer team that works with all of our transfer students and then, of course, graduate students and so on. But I think just, just important to note that we are looking to set you up for success in this process. We are an admissions office. We do want to admit students. Uh, we don't want to deny students. But beyond just you know our territories and meeting and connecting with students, there's also certain institutional uh, goals that we have to adhere to. And so making sure that all of this lines up and that uh, we are working with students closely to try to determine next steps if we're not able to offer them admission in the first year. Well, that's terrific. And I hear you loud and clear how you want to set up students for success. Eva, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Unfortunately, it leads us to our last question, which is, what are the top three pieces of advice you would give a student and their parents who are getting ready for the college admissions process? Absolutely, John. So thank you for asking. Um, I feel that I don't hear this question enough from prospective students and families. I would love for them to ask us, you know, what advice. Um, but I think that so many of them are just so invested in sort of knowing the operational end of this. And so maybe forget to ask about that advice aspect. So I think first and foremost, I know I mentioned this earlier, but just knowing that this is a partnership, um, at least for Syracuse. And so our admissions team wants to hear from prospective students and families as much as they want to hear from us. So we are here to support students, we're here to support families, and most importantly, we're, we're here to advocate for you as we're sitting in those admission committees. We're here to advocate for your high schools, for your reference letters, your personal statements. We're here to advocate, and I think the more interest that a student demonstrates, the easier it makes it for us to advocate on your behalf. Um, so don't be afraid to, to connect with us at any point throughout this process. We love hearing even from first year or second year students, sophomores, you don't have to wait until you're a junior or senior. And so just equipping yourself with as much information as possible early on and giving yourself space to, to ask those questions and connect with us, I think is going to go a long way for both ends. Um, secondly, definitely visiting and engaging with us. And so that starts um, with physical visits, but also virtual opportunities that you can, that you can do. Um, the, I think, on the, on the surface level, making sure that early on you're filling out inquiry forms for all of your top choice schools. So go on the website, these inquiry forms or QR codes will be on there for most if not all schools where you can disclose your information as much or as little as you'd like. If you'd like to just receive emails, you can disclose just your email. If you'd like to receive literature through mail, you can disclose mailing address. And so the earlier you can get on that mailing list, the earlier we can connect you with our with our teams. And so you'll receive communication across the board, um, depending on the interest that you put on that inquiry form. So that is definitely my second piece of advice is making sure that you're taking the steps to be placed on our radars. And so if your first touch point with us is at a college fair senior year, I think that might be a little too late, but making sure you start this process as early as even freshman, sophomore, and of course, junior year. And then lastly, I think just 
again, starting early and staying ahead of the deadlines and staying ahead of the requirements. So I think, especially for sophomores and juniors, you still have time to build your academic profile. You still have time to establish an upward trend on your transcript. You have time to maybe take the testing again, if that's something that you think you're going to consider submitting. So you have the advantage of time in your sophomore and junior years to continue building, to continue staying in an on an upward trend, not to get discouraged if you started out high school a little weaker, because I think trend and rigor is going to leave a very much lasting imp impression for us. Um, and so we're not just focusing on one semester or one year or one class in high school. We're looking at your overall profile holistically. Um, so making sure you know that you have the advantage of time as sophomores and juniors and using that time wisely to continue doing whatever you can to build your academic profile. Um, and then again, just staying ahead of deadlines, staying ahead of application requirements, especially in your senior year, working and trying to build a network of references as early as sophomore and junior year, identifying teachers, and counselors that you think are going to write great recommendation letters on your behalf that can maybe speak on behalf of your trend. Maybe you started out weaker in math, but you grew by the third year. That makes for a phenomenal reference letter, talking a little bit about your weaknesses and your strengths uh, throughout the semesters. So again, I think the three pieces of advice are just knowing that this is a partnership and visiting, engaging with us as much as you can, and then also staying ahead of the deadlines, informing yourself, and making sure that you're connecting with the schools to, to get as much information as you can before it's too late. Well, Eva, I cannot thank you enough. Syracuse University is obviously very lucky to have you, and it was a true honor to have you here during this podcast episode. I'm so happy because I know that this conversation yes. is going to help so many students and their parents. Yeah. I do hope to have you again. Yes. Thank you, Eva. You were awesome. Thank you again, John. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap. What's up, podcast friends? I'm happy to announce that we've teamed up with some fantastic affiliate partners to further enhance your overall college journey. So do you or someone you know need stylish dorm decor, trendy college apparel, or top-notch test prep? Whether it's creating a cozy home away from home, flaunting the latest in college apparel, or securing top-notch test prep help, we've got you covered. Check out our affiliate links in the show notes within each of these categories, which we believe will help you, our listeners. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast does get a small commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit you, our listeners. So check out the links in the show notes and share with anyone you think may benefit. Thank you all and best wishes.